Chapter 2, Psychology Behind Politics When examining the life story and personalities of the four most recent U.S. presidents, striking similarities can be found. U.S. President Bill Clinton never met his biological father. He was raised by his mother. An alcoholic and abusive stepfather came and went. Bill Clinton discovered at a relatively young age that he had a high amount of charisma in both public speaking and one-on-one -on -one interactions. This charm probably developed from being mother's little boy and consoling and entertaining his maternal companion. Furthermore, due to life circumstances, Clinton's mother most likely pushed him and was highly invested in seeing him succeed. Despite growing up in very different parts of the country and the world, Barack Obama's life story and personal development path is eerily similar. Obama's biological father separated from his mother when he was a small child. Obama wrote a memoir about how this experience affected him entitled, Dreams from My Father. Obama was raised by his mother, Ann Dunham, and his grandparents. For a few years, Obama and his mother lived with a stepfather who was a leader of the Indonesian military. Many have speculated that domestic violence may have played a role in the separation and divorce of Ann Dunham and Lolo Soy Toro, though this allegation is not widely reported as it is in the case of Clinton's stepfather. Obama's mother had big aspirations for her son, and like Bill Clinton, the young Obama discovered he had a talent for winning people's trust and charming an audience. Both Clinton and Obama came from relatively modest middle-class backgrounds, but moved up through the channels of U.S. society, namely Ivy League schools, where potential leaders are vetted. Both of them became two-term U.S. presidents from the Democratic Party, and both of them were strongly committed to regime change operations conducted in the name of human rights. Both of them developed a style of rhetoric channeling radicals of the past. Bill Clinton invoked memories of Southern populists and labor leaders. Barack Obama evoked memories of the civil rights movement. However, despite their deeply impactful rhetoric, they both delivered fairly moderate and unexciting economic and social policies. They learned the art of being radical and inspirational in tone while moderate in content. Audiences would be inspired by the radicalism and optimism in their voices while ignoring the banality of the actual words they spoke. Just as they stood before their mothers as boys, giving them hope in hard times and cheering them on a rainy day, they now stood before America, reassuring them with talk of change you can believe in or coming from a little place called hope. Meanwhile, Donald Trump and George W. Bush also have shockingly similar life stories. The father of George W. Bush was none other than CIA director, vice president, and eventual president George Herbert Walker Bush. Bush grew up in the household of his highly successful father, viewed as the screw-up, the failure, and the disappointing son. The youthful years of George W. Bush involved struggling with alcoholism and cocaine addiction and performing poorly in academics, but the young W. loved to be the life of the party and seemed to have a very strong desire to win the approval of others. Following his education at elite schools, he was involved in a series of failed business ventures before turning to politics almost as a last resort. To the surprise of his mother and brothers, George W. Bush became governor of Texas and eventually president of the United States. His bubbly malpropisms and almost childlike desire to win the approval of others became a winning attribute, making George W. Bush seem more human and genuine than his rivals. Donald Trump also had a highly achieving father who viewed him as a disappointment. Trump's father was a wealthy New York State real estate giant, while connected to inner circles of New York City's political elite. Trump's father sent his teenage son to a military boarding school, known for straightening out rebellious young men with harsh discipline. Trump, of course, had something to prove. He entered adulthood determined not only to make money, but to make a name for himself. Like Bush, Trump spent his youth as the life of the party and seemed to have a desperation for media attention and the approval of others. Like George W. Bush, 
Trump engaged in a series of grandiose yet failed business adventures before ultimately turning to politics. Trump, like Bush, became appreciated for his poor use of the English language. This made him seem more average and less manufactured than standard politicians. The crassness and impoliteness of his words also won him admiration and media attention. Bush was known for his Texas accent, his improper grammar, and his pushing of the envelope when it came to authoritarianism. He spoke of fine terrorists like a cowboy movie, saying he would smoke them out, and defended the use of torture. Trump is known for making wildly factually inaccurate statements as well as wildly self-aggrandizing ones. His rhetorical style includes giving demeaning nicknames and his political rivals and emphasizing how tough he is. Trump has called for killing the family members of suspected terrorists and also saying that he believes in torture. Barack Obama and Bill Clinton are certainly not clones. Neither are Trump and George W. Bush. However, their life stories and family history are eerily similar, and this fact should certainly raise the eyebrows of anyone who has studied personality theory. The position of U.S. President is vitally important to seeing the course of global events. The ability to influence the person in such a position, push your buttons, motivate them to take certain actions, and prevent them from taking others is vitally important. Billions of dollars and millions of lives are often on the line. The fact that similar personalities have occupied the Oval Office for the past few decades is not accidental or merely the natural workings of our political system. One can be sure that the personality of each potential POTUS is heavily studied from a number of different angles, but different forces that seek to push them in one direction or another. The rise of Kamala Harris must be understood in this context. What is her family background? How has it impacted her career trajectory? When discussing someone who was rejected by Democratic primary voters, but is likely to soon have her finger on the nuclear button, it becomes an important question. That little girl was me. On the debate stage during the Democratic primary in June of 2019, Kamala Harris often clashed with Joe Biden. Biden and Bernie Sanders were the top two candidates favored among Democratic voters, and Kamala wanted to secure her position in the race. While Kamala clashed with other candidates, memories of her pre-adolescent childhood were invoked far more frequently than is usual for politicians. Growing up, my sister and I had to deal with a neighbor who told us her parents said they couldn't play with us because we were black, she told the millions who watched a debate on CNN. When she went after Joe Biden, her rhetoric got even more personal. I'm going to now direct this at Vice President Biden. I do not believe you are a racist. I agree with you when you commit yourself to the importance of finding common ground. I also believe it's personal. It was actually hurtful to hear you talk about the reputations of two United States senators who built their reputations and career on the segregation of race in this country. It was not only that, but you also worked with them to oppose busing. There was a little girl in California who was part of the second class to integrate her public schools. She was bused to school every day. That little girl was me. These were not accidental or unplanned remarks, as almost immediately afterward, her campaign website began offering t-shirts with photographs of Kamala Harris as a small child with her hair in braids. The phrase, that little girl was me, was immediately all over Twitter. The photo and phrase had been a planned meme for marketing Kamala Harris. However, it points to the fact that Kamala Harris deeply identifies with her pre-adolescent self and feelings associated with her childhood are a primary motivation for her behavior right up to the present day. The little girl that Kamala Harris invokes and the strong emotions attached to it underlie many of her actions. This theme can be consistently observed throughout her political career. In 2010, Kamala Harris spoke before the Commonwealth Club of California. This theme can be consistently observed throughout her political career. In 2010, Kamala Harris spoke before the Commonwealth Club of California. A disturbing clip from these remarks has been widely circulated. 
showing a side of Kamala Harris, which her campaign would most likely prefer to conceal. In this clip, Kamala boasts that she jailed the parents of truant kids and laughs about it. Well, this was a little controversial in San Francisco, she says with a big grin on her face before breaking into a cackle of sadistic laughter. Frankly, my staff went bananas. They were concerned because they didn't know at the time whether I was going to have an opponent in the election. She went on to describe the feelings of power she felt in her position after taking it. As a prosecutor in law enforcement, I have a huge stick. The school district has got a carrot. Let's work in tandem around our collective objective and goal to get these kids in school. She went on to giggle about a parent showing a letter from the district attorney's office to her children saying, if you don't go to school, Kamala's going to put you and me in jail. Most viewers are disturbed by the fact that Kamala Harris seems to relish having a big stick and being able to punish low-income people. The jailing of low-income parents for their children's truancy is unlikely to improve their life circumstances. The fact that Kamala boasts that she rushed to implement this policy as soon as she came into office is equally disturbing. However, the most telling statement in the clips comes just prior to Kamala describing her harsh actions. Kamala stated, I would not be standing here were it not for the education I received. And I know many of us would say the same thing. I believe a child going without an education is a tantamount to a crime, so I decided I was going to start prosecuting parents for truancy. We see this common pattern in her rhetoric. Kamala Harris invokes her own childhood and how she would not be standing here if her parents had not sent her to school in order to justify her actions. She goes on to boast about how she felt after taking office. She had enough capital to take this dramatic move despite the political risks. She speaks of her big stick she giggles with delight about how upset her staff was with her decision. She speaks of parents sending their kids to school out of fear of incarceration and how delighted she felt about sending a letter with the district attorney's badge on the letterhead to parents throughout the Bay Area. So why does Kamala seem to evoke childhood memories so much? Why is a woman who is well over 50 years old constantly invoking her life situation during the late 1960s and early 70s? Meet Donald Harris. In February of 2019, Donald Harris, the father of Kamala Harris, opened up about his daughter and her presidential campaign. He was infuriated because Kamala Harris has stated, half my family is from Jamaica, are you kidding me? When asked if she had smoked marijuana, Donald's words were harsh. My dear departed grandmothers, as well as my deceased parents, must be turning in their grave right now to see their family's name, reputation, and proud to make an identity being connected in any way, jokingly or not, with the fraudulent stereotype of pot-smoking joy seeker and in the pursuit of identity politics. Speaking for myself and my immediate Jamaican family, we wish to categorically dissociate ourselves from this travesty. Donald Harris is an economics professor now retired with emerita status from Stanford University, to describe Donald Harris as a communist is a bit of an exaggeration. He is certainly heavily influenced by Marx's economic theories in his analysis of unemployment and GDP growth. His writings certainly discuss concepts such as overproduction, the falling rate of profit, and the general law of capitalist accumulation, and apply them when explaining and predicting trends. However, Donald Harris is not a left-wing agitator or even really an activist. In addition to teaching courses at Stanford University, Harris served as an economic advisor to three Jamaican prime ministers. Social democracy and the labor right political tradition certainly has a lot of influence in Jamaica. Michael Manley served as prime minister from 1972 to 1980 and from 1989 to 1992. Manley called himself a democratic socialist and enacted many progressive reforms, including the creation of free health care clinics, rent and price controls, and subsidies of food for low-income people. 
Donald Harris seems to have functioned not as a political strategist, agitator, or commentator, but as a policy formulator and an interpreter of economic data, giving advice to Jamaican elected officials behind the scenes. He most likely had significant influence with the administrations of a number of prime ministers who struggled to increase living standards and stabilize the impoverished Caribbean country. Aside from his denunciation of his daughter's statements about Jamaica, a short essay entitled Reflections of a Jamaican Father, Donald Harris has so far been mostly silent about his daughter and intends to remain so. However, the essay in which Harris reflects on his upbringing is quite revealing and provides us with some insights into what underlying motivations lay beneath Kamala's words and actions. Donald Harris writes regarding his two estranged daughters, My one big regret is that they did not come to know very well the two most influential women in my life, Miss Krishi and Miss Iris, as everybody called them. This is, in many ways, a story about these women and the heritage they gave us. My roots go back within my lifetime to my paternal grandmother, Miss Krishi, ni Christiana Brown, descendant of Hamilton Brown, who is on record a plantation slave owner and founder of Brownstown, and to my maternal grandmother, Miss Iris, ni Iris Finnegan, farmer and educator from Eon Town in Inverness, ancestry unknown to me. The Harris name comes from my paternal grandfather, Joseph Alexander Harris, landowner and agriculture produce exporter, mostly pimento or allspice, who died in 1939, one year after I was born, and is buried in the churchyard of the magnificent Anglican Church, which Hamilton Brown built in Brownstown, and where, as a child, I learned the catechism, was baptized and confirmed, and served as an acolyte. Both of my grandmothers had the strongest influence on my early upbringing, not to exclude, of course, the influence of my dear mother, Miss Beryl, or loving father, Mas Oscar. Harris reflects on the influence of Miss Krishi on his trajectory towards studying economics. There was a daily diet of politics as well. She was a great admirer of Busta, Sir William Alexander Busta Monte, then chief minister in the colonial government and leader of the Jamaican Labour Party. She claimed with conviction and pride to be a laborite, as members of the JLP were called, and for the interesting reason that, as she argued, labor is at the heart of everything in life. Little did I know then, what I learned later in studying economics, that my grandmother was espousing her independently discovered version of a labor theory of value. The adventurous and assertive one. Harris tells a touching anecdote about his two daughters and subtly hinting at Camel's character as a child. Now, far away in the diaspora in 2018, one of the most vivid and fondest memories I have of that early period with my children is of the visit we made in 1970 to Orange Hill. We trudged through the Calgdon and rusted iron gates uphill and downhill along narrow unkempt paths to the very end of the family property, all in my eagerness to show to the girls the terrain over which I had wandered daily for hours as a boy, with Miss Christie hollering in the distance, Y'all better come here now, boy, or else. Upon reaching the top of a little hill that opened much of that terrain to our full view, Kamala, ever the adventurous and assertive one, suddenly broke from the pack, leaving behind Maya, the more cautious one, and took off like a gazelle in Serengeti, leaping over rocks and shrubs and fallen branches in utter joy and unleashed curiosity to explore that same enticing terrain. I quickly followed her with my trusted Canon Super 8 movie camera to record the moment in my usual role as cameraman for every occasion. I couldn't help thinking there and then, what a moment of exciting rediscovery being handed over from one generation to another. His reference to Kamala as ever the adventurous and assertive one seems to indicate that there are certain character traits the VP nominee had in her childhood which have carried over into adulthood. Donald Harris is reflecting on the character of his now world-famous daughter at the age of six in 1970 before she was swept out of his life by a divorce that was likely far more ugly than Kamala wants the world to know. Harris writes, 
This early phase of interaction with my children came to an abrupt halt in 1972 when after a hard-fought custody battle in the family court of Oakland, California, the context of the relationship was placed within arbitrary limits imposed by a court-ordered divorce settlement based on the false assumption by the state of California the fathers cannot handle parenting, especially in the case of this father. A Negro from the islands was the Yankee stereotype who might just end up eating his children for breakfast. Nevertheless, I persisted, never giving up on my love for my children or renegating on my responsibilities as their father. So here we are now. Donald's words about family court in Oakland completely contradicts the presentation of events found in Kamala's autobiography. Kamala writes about her parents' separation. They didn't fight about money. The only thing they fought about was who got the books. It is pretty apparent that her parents fought about a few other things, namely who got custody over Kamala and her younger sister. The fact that Kamala chose to conceal this in her autobiography could be very telling. In another passage, Kamala reflects on her parents' relationship with carefully chosen words. I've often thought that had they been a little older, more emotionally mature, maybe the marriage could have survived. But they were so young. My father was my mother's first boyfriend. The implication of this fact about her mother's lack of a dating history prior to her marriage could be read as presenting her mother as young and naive or could instead be interpreted to present her father as predatory. The implication is carefully left to the reader. None of this would be worth discussing if not for the fact that Kamala Harris speaks of her childhood excessively. The implication of some of her statements is that we are almost expected to vote for her simply out of sympathy for the suffering she endured as a 10-year-old. Sympathy for ethnic minority children and the very real hardships that have endured in times past and still endure across the country is a quite important theme in the rhetoric of identity politics. Many black activists, for example, argued that they voted for Barack Obama simply so their children could grow up with the self-esteem of knowing it was possible for them to be president. Kamala's constant evoking of her childhood could simply be about marketing herself in the age of what detractors refer to as ID poll. But other aspects of the biographical narrative put out by Kamala's staff and supporters are worth noting. In addition to the references to childhood, the Harris campaign has done a lot to almost canonize her now deceased mother. Shamala Gopalan is presented as a feminist pioneer, immigrating from India, getting her degree, and becoming a cancer researcher. Photos of Shamala have been tweeted out. Anecdotes have her come up in Kamala's speeches. However, Kamala Harris and her campaign are pretty silent in regard to her father. He receives no such canonization despite also being an immigrant and a man of color who met her mother through left-wing activism. The fact that Donald says he lost his ability to really interact with his daughters in 1972 and that he denounced her in the press indicates that the relationship between them is weak at best. The harshness of Donald's words, referring to Kamala's campaign as a travesty and engaging in pursuit of identity politics certainly stands out. Have the relevance of any potential U.S. presidents in recent years spoken so harshly? What is the source of this obvious tension and weak relationship between Kamala Harris and her father? Other than a divorce, we really do not know. We can only speculate. In Donald's essay reflecting on his Jamaican upbringing and his relationship with his own daughters, he describes his paternal grandmother and speaks in a positive tone about her use of corporal punishment. Harris writes, Miss Christie was the disciplinarian, reserved and stern in look, firm with the strap, but capable of the most endearing and genuine acts of love, affection, and care. Corporal punishment is widely a practice among Jamaicans and Jamaican Americans even today. In 2020, school teachers in Jamaica are still known to spank or beat their students, though officially urged not to do so by the Ministry of Education. The British colonial tradition of six of the best canings is something that remains part of life for school children in many parts of the developing world. Jamaica maintained the practice of sentencing juvenile offenders and other criminals to floggings with a tamarind switch until 1998. 
Many Jamaican legislators have proposed this punishment method be revived as an alternative to jail and receive lots of public support in their call. Did Donald Harris beat his daughters? Does Kamala resent him because of this? This is certainly possible. In the 1960s and 70s, corporal punishment of children was far more widely accepted and was nearly expected among both families in schools in the United States across almost all strata of society. Dr. Spock's best-selling book urging parents to refrain from this traditional disciplinary practice was often mocked and rejected. Even today, 19 U.S. states allow teachers in public schools to beat students with wooden paddles. However, the liberal activist and academic environment which Kamala's parents inhabited would most likely have frowned on such methods of child rearing. So this is quite unclear. Is it possible her parents disagreed in regard to how young Kamala and her sister were disciplined? The fixation of vengeful justice and punishment that defines Kamala's adult life would certainly fit the profile of one who had experienced harsh beatings as a child. However, in times past in which extreme corporal punishment was fairly common, many grew into adulthood having experienced harsh corporal punishment without sadistic tendencies Kamala Harris displays. Perhaps the resentment is rooted in other aspects of her parents' separation. The split between Kamala's parents was clearly not a friendly one. What was the immaturity Kamala blames for the failure of her parents' marriage? What prompted the divorce? Was, in, was there an extramarital affair? Was there domestic violence? Is it possible that young Kamala observed her father striking her mother? We do not know the answer to these questions. Is it perhaps possible that Donald Harris was nothing but a gentle, patient, loving father? Could it be that Kamala's family experienced financial hardships following the divorce as two children were raised by a single mother? Did Shyamala perhaps scapegoat her ex-husband and raise Kamala and her sister to believe he was responsible for the problems of their household? Much has been written about the painful effects of what is called Parental child abduction and alienation, where in divorce proceedings, children are pulled away from one parent and incited against some. This is not done out of pure intention of protecting the children, but out of a selfish parent's desire to spite and punish the other parent. Donald's essay hints that he is coming from a defensive place and that perhaps his responsibilities as a father have been questioned. In Donald's public denunciation of his daughter, it becomes clear that stereotypes of Jamaicans as lazy, pot-smoking, irresponsible, and not good fathers get under his skin more than anything else. Did young Kamala observe her mother pushing these buttons to evoke her father's rage? Did her mother adopt this narrative about her father presenting him as such a stereotype to her daughters in the aftermath of the divorce? There is certainly deep pain of some sort underlying Kamala's cruelty. The estrangement from her father is likely to be a major source of such pain. In the truths we hold, while Kamala clearly has glossed over much of the pain of her upbringing, on a few occasions she reveals inner damage beneath the surface. Describing her high school commencement ceremony, she writes, I invited both of my parents to come to my graduation, even though I knew they wouldn't speak to each other. I still wanted them both to be there for me. I'll never forget sitting in the first couple of rows of the auditorium, looking out in the audience. My mother was nowhere to be found. Where is she? I thought. Is she not here because my father is? Then all of a sudden, the back door of the auditorium opened up and my mother walked in wearing a bright red dress and heels. She was never one to let the situation get the better of her. In this anecdote, once again, Shamala is the hero. The fact that her mother might be so afraid of seeing Donald Harris that she would potentially skip her daughter's commencement ceremony almost a decade later indicates more than mere bad feelings about a failed marriage. Whether Kamala Harris was aware of it or not, when she destroyed the lives of pot smokers, withheld evidence to convict people, blocked exonerations, and jailed low-income parents, she was not protecting the innocent or sticking up for the downtrodden. The result of breaking apart families is tragic. As a result of her many actions as a rising star in California's prosecutorial school-to-prison pipeline apparatus, getting tough on crime, and pushing for harsh sentences, countless thousands of children grew up like her, without their father. Kamala's use of her cherished big stick 
to tear apart families, the actions she cackles about did not really benefit children. It seems that the little girl who Kamler frequently invokes, the one who probably once felt powerless and afraid, is seeking to exact revenge. The actual results for actual people are irrelevant. As the image of 10-year-old Kamla flickers in her mind, a rage that has burned for decades continues to kindle. No matter how many lives are destroyed, the world must be made to understand that little girl was me. The Destructive Impulse Much like the similarities between Obama and Clinton, Trump and Bush, Kamala's life story is all too similar to many other prominent female political figures. Amy Klobuchar, the U.S. Senator from Minnesota who also ran in the 2020 Democratic presidential primary, has a similar biography. She was raised by mother after a divorce. In her case, we know there was domestic violence, with her alcoholic father beating her mother. Like Kamala, Amy was estranged from her father until he became sober decades later. Amy Klobuchar became a criminal prosecutor in the same era and utilized the same fear-mongering tactics, filling prisons in Minnesota with low-income African-American men. Samantha Power, the UN ambassador under Barack Obama, who worked inside the White House pushing for the Libyan intervention, shares a similar life story. Power was born in Ireland. When Samantha Power was nine years old, she moved to the United States with her mother, Power and her mother left behind her father, who died of an alcohol-induced illness a few years later. Kamala Harris, Amy Globochar, and Samantha Power have dedicated their lives to punishing and destroying. Harris and Globochar destroyed the lives of low-income, mostly black men in courtrooms, and rose up in the ranks due to the enthusiasm which they carried out this task and sharing huge profits for the prison industrial complex. Samantha Power dedicated her life to building the case not for the incarceration of individuals, but for the military destruction of nations. In her book, Problem from Hell, America and the Age of Genocide, Power wrote that the U.S. government needed help from American reporters, editorial boards, and advocacy groups in order to convince the world about the need to ruthlessly bomb and destabilize former Yugoslavia. Just as a fishmonger sells fish, Samantha Power sold war. She pushed for the bombing of Yugoslavia, the destruction of Libya, and defended efforts to destabilize Syria. Similar to Kamala Harris's jailing of Trudan children, the results did not improve people's lives. Millions of Serbians, Syrians, and Libyans were killed, had their homes destroyed, or were forced to become refugees. But to Samantha Power, it wasn't about helping people, but punishing people. Just like how Kamala's imprisoning of low-income parents did not really help their truant school children. Not surprisingly, Samantha Power built the case for war against regimes that was led by a powerful male figure, deemed to be a dictator in Western press. Samantha Power had spent her adult life building the case for military interventions and covert operations to remove strong men who led governments and often had a somewhat fatherly public persona. Muammar Gaddafi actually referred to Barack Obama as his little African son. It is easy to speculate that in the psyche of Kamala Harris, the parents of truant children and the various African-American males she convicted are psychological stand-ins for a dark-skinned father whom she has a high amount of rage. Of course, none of this can be certain. In each of these life histories of president and pro in each of these life histories of president and political figures, there are undoubtedly countless unknown factors driving their career choices and personality development. Biological factors like brain chemistry, the influence of religion, the personality of influential teachers, mentors, and childhood friends all can have a measurable impact in how the human mind and personality develops. Books like The Truths We Hold, which are published by politicians aspiring for the presidency, are often carefully edited in order to market the candidate. In generations past, 
Many Americans grew up hearing a story of George Washington admitting to cutting down his father's cherry tree because he cannot tell a lie. The story is now universally recognized to be fictional propaganda intended to moralize school children in the generations after Washington's death. While technology and accessibility of information have certainly changed since the early years of the United States, the dishonest nature of personality cults and political leaders have not. Everything in Kamala's memoirs and speeches and in her father's reflections should be taken with a grain of salt. If Kamala Harris ends up being vice president or president, we will learn indefinitely more about her character as it is on display before the world. We will see what Kamala has to offer, not just in terms of words, but also in terms of concrete policy that can impact the lives of potentially billions of people. The Revolutionary Intelligentsia This impulse to destroy and tear things down was a key factor in the bourgeois revolutions to overthrow feudalism and establish the liberal societies around which the global economy is now centered. In 1804, the English poet William Blake composed these verses to celebrate sentiments of the age when nation states and democratic republics were established as kings fell amid revolutionary bloodbaths. Blake wrote, Bring me my bow of burning gold, bring me my arrows of desire, bring me my spear, O clouds unfold, bring me my chariot of fire, I will not cease from mental fight nor shall my sword sleep in my hand till we have built Jerusalem in England's green and pleasant land. As these words were written, the world was still reacting to the dramatic events in France during the previous decade. The monarchy had been toppled and a republic had been established. A reign of terror involving mass executions of nobles, priests, and individuals deemed to be contrary to the French Revolution's values had taken place. The guillotine, now used as a class struggle emblem by some young liberal democratic socialists, was used to behead thousands of people in a carnival-like atmosphere. The French Revolution involved the active deconstruction not only of the feudal economic and political order, but the mindset that went along with it. Peasants, who had been forbidden from even looking nobles in the eye, and had been forced to bow and obey in almost every aspect of life, were suddenly given permission to unleash their rage. This explosion of rage shook all of society and enabled the capitalists to take power from feudal aristocrats. Previously restrained sexual impulses were also unleashed. The Marquis de Sade, the pornographic French writer from whom the term sadism is derived, was a key figure in the French Revolution. Saad had been imprisoned at the Bastille for his sexual assaults and other antisocial behaviors. From inside the prison, he had screamed out the windows to the crowds on the streets of Paris that prisoners inside were being tortured and cruelly treated. Sensing that Marquis was agitating Parisians and potentially causing unrest, the jailers transferred him to a mental hospital outside of the city. Ten days after the Marquis de Sade was removed from the infamous prison, Mobs of revolutionaries stormed it on July 14th, 1789. The storming of the Bastille is considered an iconic moment in French history, celebrated with a national holiday. The Marquis de Sade's role in the French Revolution was not limited to agitation from prison windows. Sade was a keynote speaker at the funeral of Jacobin agitator Jean-Paul Marat, giving a glowing eulogy. From the Marquis de Sade, sexuality and violence were closely linked to each other, and the unleashing of both signified the liberation of mankind. Indeed, the unleashing of passion and rage was key in bringing down feudalism. As a result of the French Revolution, it has become an almost permanent attribute of leftist politics as it developed. The terms left and right actually originated in the French National Assembly formed amid revolutionary upheaval. Those loyal to the king sat on the right, while the radicals and advocates of liberty, equality, and fraternity sat on the left. Sigmund Freud, the founder of psychoanalysis, wrote that renegotiating the restraints imposed by society and the natural impulses of individuals towards violence and sex 
is a key factor underlying many political conflicts throughout history. Freud wrote, The liberty of the individual is no gift to civilization. The development of civilization imposes restriction on it, and justice demands that no one escape those restrictions. What makes itself felt in a human community is a desire for freedom may be their revolt against some existing injustice, and so many prove favorable to further development of civilization. It may remain compatible with civilization, but it may also spring from the remains of their original personality, which is still untamed by civilization and thus may be the basis in them for hostility to civilization. The urge for freedom, therefore, is directed against particular forms and demands of civilization or against civilization altogether. It does not seem that any influence could induce a man to change his nature into a termites. No doubt he will defend his claim of individual liberty against the will of the group. A good part of the struggles of mankind center around the single task of finding an expedient accommodation one that is that will bring happiness between the claims of the individual and cultural claims of the group. And one of the problems that touches the fate of humanity is whether such an accommodation can be reached by some particular form of civilization or whether this conflict is irreconcilable. The French Revolution gave birth to a tendency of modern capitalist societies that can be rightly called the revolutionary intelligentsia. These are intellectuals, students, artists, writers, and activists who feel alienated from society and seek to build a new world. These bohemians or radicals existed across Europe in the 1800s and now exist in almost every country in the world. It is a middle-class current in which youth are significantly represented. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels were among these strata debating the other left Hegelians in the cafes of Paris and London. Marxism emerged as the dominant current among the students and intellectuals of Europe who felt the bourgeois revolutions had failed to deliver a truly just society and that building Jerusalem required further stormings of barricades and firing of rifles. While conservatives throughout Europe sought to reinforce religion, patriarchy, and tradition, the organized political left became associated with lifting restraints on human impulses. The Marxists generally sought to come to power by giving workers permission to be angry at their bosses, giving women permission to be angry about traditional gender roles, giving youth permission to be angry at authority, and combining this anger into a gigantic social explosion in which the revolutionaries could take power. This was the method of the French Revolution, and throughout Europe it was quite effective. Karl Marx participated in the 1848 German Revolution, as did Friedrich Nietzsche and Richard Wagner. The unleashing of passion was certainly evident in the 1848 events as peasants marched off to battle singing Deutschland, Deutschland über alles in the hopes of toppling the local nobles and aristocrats and uniting the various territories into a modern nation-state governed by a democratic republic. The failure of the 1848 revolution resulted in a mass exodus from Germany by the socialist radicals and religious fanatics who had fought on the front lines. The various Marxist revolutionaries of the 20th century, Lenin, Trotsky, Mao, Castro, Guevara, and others originated among the revolutionary intelligentsia as wealthy students who studied revolutionary ideas and sought to remake the world around them. Many of them learned to effectively unleash the rage of peasants and workers and students against the semi-feudal systems of the developing world and utilize the unleashing of passions in order to take power. Mao Zedong, for example, knew very well how to tap into the anger of peasants against landlords, as well as the anger of youth at China's highly traditional Confucian family structure. Rage at the old regime was very visible in the immediate aftermath of the Russian Revolution with the destruction of churches. The large number of executions of figures from the Batista regime in the early years of the Cuban Revolution harnessed similar anger. The Emergence of Constructive Socialism However, 
when communists have taken power, they hold on to power by appealing to very different emotions. The strength of the Soviet Union was not that it gave permission to individuals to unleash their rage, but rather that it provided a sense of community and joint effort that enabled the country to be rapidly industrialized. The PBS documentary film Red Flag 1917, produced after the fall of the Soviet Union, featured interviews with Tatiana Fedorova. As a youth, Tatiana had been a leader of construction projects during Stalin's five-year plans to industrialize the Soviet Union. The full transcript of her interview had been published online. Fedorova described a feeling of building the USSR into an industrial superpower. Remember, people were illiterate, lived in virtual darkness, wore birch bark shoes. Even now, I think it's something out of a fairy tale. It was one of the most difficult times to build this country. To build these great construction sites would only be possible through unity, the unity of the people, and the love of the people to their idol. Stalin for us was an idol. The five-year economic plans of the Soviet Union were viewed with wonder by the entire world. While capitalism was having a Great Depression, the Soviet Union was being transformed into an industrial superpower. Illiteracy was wiped out. The entire country was electrified and provided with running water. A modern agricultural system with tractors was constructed, as was a modern steel and oil refinery industry. With socialist central planning, the Soviet Union was able to build itself up into an industrial society that defeated the Nazi invaders and launched the first spacecraft into orbit. Fedorova went on to describe the experience of building the Moscow subways. Everyone was trying to do the best for the country, to raise the heights of the motherland. Then, there was what we were doing underground. With the Moscow Metro, we worked in such a friendly way. It was such a good time. There wasn't so much to eat. We weren't well dressed. We were simply very happy. Happy because we were making it our personal contribution. When asked about her proudest moment, she said, It was when the first train went by. It was when the noise of the motor of the first train went by in this clean tunnel which had, until then, only seen the ordinary little carriages. You can't compare that feeling to anything. The construction workers who felt that will feel it forever. No one forced us to do it. We didn't have to do it, but everyone wanted to. It's very hard to explain, but it was the time of the enthusiast. At the time, Mayakovsky said that communism is the young people of the world, and we were the young people of those years. Each of us tried to build a foundation of the structures with great joy. It was like a happy song. When the interviewers from PBS pressed her about the Moscow trials and Great Terror, asking if they had tarnished her faith in socialism, she said, No. No, because it was one thing, some political events which happened, and happened in every country, opposition and so forth. It was a different matter that the country was going on its way at its own speed. People were working. We're talking about a country of many millions. The whole population of the country worked, lived, studied, and sang songs. It didn't mean that everything was extinguished or everything was lost. No, it was a dark stain. It was a dark sting, but I'll repeat once more that the country was working. All the enterprises were working. The factories were working. Children were studying at schools. The fact that these political intrigues and games happened is very unfortunate. It was a very hard time, but the country was growing and growing at great speed. There was great power. The transformation of China from being the sick man of Asia to the status of the second largest economy on earth, lifting 800 million people from poverty, has been equally inspiring and equally based on a sense of community and cooperation. Cuba's medical system that sent volunteers across the world, the mobilizations for construction and relief that enabled Hugo Chavez to become very popular in 1999 and defeat the 2002 coup attempt all drew heavily from this sense of solidarity and optimism. Figures like Edgar Snow, William Hinton, 
and Anna Louise Strom visited socialist countries. They reported on the ability of communists to effectively defeat fascist invaders and mobilize the population, often comparing it to early Christianity. The communists were able to unleash a sense of brotherhood and community that was powerful enough to raise millions from poverty and defeat imperialist attacks. Across the planet, one can see the great construction projects and achievements carried out by communists and socialists in the developing world. The world's largest irrigation system was constructed by the Islamic Socialist Government of Libya. The Dnieper Dam, constructed in the Soviet Union's first five-year plan, was the largest hydroelectric power plant in the world at the time it was completed in 1931. It brought electricity to Ukraine and other parts of the Soviet Union. The largest power plant in the Middle East, the Aswan Dam, constructed by the Arab socialist leader Abdul Nasser in coordination with the Soviet Union, brought electricity to all of Egypt. The China-Pakistan Friendship Highway is one of the longest and highest elevated roadways on Earth. It was built by Chinese communists determined to free their country from the economic isolation that followed the Sino-Soviet split. The highway laid the basis for the origins of the now-flourishing China-Pakistan Economic Corridor. The Soviet space program was the result of the combined heroic efforts of millions of people in the aftermath of the Second World War. It was socialist central planning that launched the first satellites and put the first person into orbit. The Cuban healthcare system is widely described as one of the greatest in the world. Cuba's medical school that trains doctors from other countries is also widely praised. The largest hydroelectronic power plant in the world today is the Three Gorges Dam in China, built as part of the Communist Party's efforts to reduce poverty and increasing living standards in rural areas. Many more examples could be given. The achievements of socialism are vast, but the achievements were not conducted on the basis of unleashing anger and seeking punitive revenge. The achievements of socialism were the results of mass mobilizations of the population in a spirit of collectivism. Across Eastern Europe, communists led the reconstruction efforts following the Second World War, paving roads, building hospitals, and raising countries to a higher level of industrialization and living standards than they have ever experienced. The post-war years in Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and other countries liberated by Soviet troops from Nazi invaders are remembered as years of great optimism. Following the Second World War, the Soviet Union pushed communist, anti-peerless, and democratic youth groups around the world to establish the World Democratic Youth Federation. Young people from many different countries who had seen the carnage of war took this pledge. We pledge that we shall remember this unity, forged in this month, November 1945, not only today, not only this week, this year, but always until we have built the world we have dreamed of and fought for. We pledge ourselves to build the unity of youth of the world, all races, all colors, all nationalities, all beliefs, to eliminate all traces of fascism from the earth, to build a deep and sincere international friendship among the peoples of the world, to keep a just, lasting peace, to eliminate want, frustration, and enforce idleness. We have come to confirm the unity of all you salute our comrades who have died and pledged our word that skillful hands, keen brains, and young enthusiasm shall never more be wasted in war. Every four years, a world festival of youth and students was convened by socialist, communist, anti-imperialist, and anti-fascist youth in order to encourage the spirit of human solidarity and unity. Many Wonders and Signs In the early years of the Soviet Union, the Communist Party had an internal debate about the way forward. The country was still recovering from a horrendous civil war. Millions of people have died when 15 different countries invaded the Soviet Union in hopes of overturning the Socialist Revolution. Stalin favored a program of socialism in one country, while Trotsky proposed a program of permanent revolution. In essence, Stalin sought to appeal to the collective desires of the Soviet peoples for a better life, while Trotsky sought to continue to unleash rage and vengeance. 
striving for a global revolutionary conflagration, the peoples of the Soviet Union were weary of war, and Trotsky's program of militarizing the life of factory workers and peasants was unappealing to the population, though many hardline Bolsheviks were mistakenly attached to it. Speaking on January 25, 1921, Stalin criticized the permanent revolution concept, saying, a group of party workers headed by Trotsky, intoxicated by the successes achieved by military methods in the army, supposes that those methods can and must be adopted among the workers in the trade unions. In order to achieve similar successes in strengthening the unions and in reviving industry, but this group forgets that the army and the working class are two different spheres, that a method that is suitable for the army may prove to be unsuitable, harmful for the working class and its trade unions. From Once Again on the Trade Unions, 1921. Joseph Stalin, a mass organizer who had been educated in a seminary, was known for appealing to quite different sentiments among the people. Long before the Bolshevik Revolution, Trotsky had observed this aspect of Stalin with scorn. History Simon Seabag Montefiore writes in his biography, Jan Stalin, about the organizing style of Russia's future Man of Steel. The workers listened reverently to this young preacher, and it was no coincidence that many of the revolutionaries were seminarists and the workers often pious ex-peasants. Trotsky, agitated in another city, remembered that many of the workers thought the movement resembled the early Christians and had to be taught that they should be atheists. Montefiore describes how the Bolshevik leader became highly popular when locked in prison alongside non-political criminals. Stalin was soon the kingpin of Batumi prison, dominating his friends, terrorizing the intellectuals, suborning the guards, and befriending the criminals. Stalin was hostile to bumptious intellectuals, but he was less with the less educated worker revolutionaries who did not arouse his inferiority complex. He played the teacher, the priest. Trotsky and Western intellectuals who favored a permanent revolution and incarnated the mindset of the revolutionary intelligentsia viewed the industrialization of the USSR with disgust. They denounced Stalin as socially conservative, conducting a thermidor in the family, and then saw the moment when the population was mobilized to construct as the USSR becoming a degenerate worker state. However, the words of Tatiana Fedorova and the millions of other Soviet people who saw their homeland built into an industrial fortress was strong enough to eventually withstand a fascist invasion tell a different story. In contemporary Russia, Stalin is far more popular than Lenin. Many anti-communists look up to Stalin for his building up of the country. When Stalin built the mausoleum for Lenin and declared the ideology of the Communist Party to be Marxism-Leninism, many noted the orthodox religious influence on the propaganda of the new state. Speaking at Lenin's memorial meeting, Stalin spoke of communists not as chaos creators, executioners, or vandals, but as a group of people dedicated to living selflessly for the purpose of reinventing mankind. Comrades, we communists are people of a special mold. We are made of a special stuff. We are those who form the army of the great proletarian strategists, the army of Comrade Lenin. There is nothing higher than the honor of belonging to this army. There is nothing higher than the title of member of the party whose founder and leader was Comrade Lenin. It is not given to everyone to be a member of such a party. It is the sons of the working class, the sons of one to struggle, the sons of incredible privation and heroic effort who before all should be members of such a party. This is why the party of the Leninists, the party of the communists, is also called the party of the working class from On the Death of Lenin, 1924. In his text, Civilization and Its Discontents, Sigmund Freud speaks with contempt for feelings his religious friends describe to him. He writes, It is a feeling which he would like to call a sensation of eternity, a feeling as something limitless and unbounded, as it were, oceanic. This feeling, he adds, is a purely subjective fact. 
not an article of faith. It brings with no assurance of personal mortality, but a source of religious energy seized upon by various churches and religious systems, directed by them into particular channels, and doubtless exhausted by them. One may, he thinks, rightfully call oneself religious on the grounds of this oceanic feeling, even if one rejects every faith and every illusion. Freud speaks of these feelings with contempt, viewing them as a leftover from a previous stage of human evolution when we were closer to termites or wolves in a pack and had not developed the individualism that defines mankind. He writes, I can imagine that the oceanic feeling became connected with religion later on, the oneness with the universe that constitutes its additional Content sounds like a first attempt at religious consolation, as though it were another way of disclaiming the danger which the ego recognizes as threatening from the external world. However, Freud does not seem to realize that it is the sense of oneness and belonging in the community of a desire to be part of a joint effort and cause greater than oneself that laid the basis for the achievements not just of socialism but of all human civilization human beings are collective in nature and our progress as a species has been defined by when socialism took power across the world during the 20th century it broke with the destructiveness of the revolutionary intelligentsia when revolutionaries utilized the anchor and releasing of impulses to take power, the Bolsheviks, the Chinese Communist Party, the Baathists, and the Bolivarians won the loyalty of populations by unleashing collectivism and solidarity. Interestingly, the New Testament describes a similar feeling among the early years of the Christian Church. They devoted themselves to the Apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. From Acts chapter 4, verses 42 to 47. Zbigniew Brzezinski and Susan Sontag The man who probably had the greatest responsibility for the victory of the United States in the Cold War, aside from Henry Kissinger, was Zbigniew Brzezinski. He was a Polish-born anti-communist who hated Russians on an ethnic level. Based on hundreds of years of tension between Poland and Russia, Brzezinski studied first in Montreal and then at Harvard University, always focusing on how to roll back the influence of the Soviet Union. Brzezinski emphasized the concept of peaceful engagement with the socialist countries of Eastern Europe. He urged the U.S. government to back away from hardline doctrine anti-communism and to instead focus on manipulating communists against each other. He became a principal strategist in the Cold War, advising U.S. presidents such as Kennedy, Johnson, and Reagan. Jimmy Carter called himself a student of Zbigniew Brzezinski. Brzezinski worked intensely with the Rockefeller's Trilateral Commission to develop a new strategy for defeating communism in the aftermath of the defeat of the United States in the Vietnam War. He was appointed to be Jimmy Carter's National Security Advisor. Ronald Reagan awarded him the Presidential Medal of Freedom. During the Vietnam War, many young leftists had begun to identify with the peasants of Vietnam fighting the foreign occupiers. The U.S. was viewed as an authoritarian force of tanks and planes, while the Vietnamese National Liberation Front was impoverished farmers fighting in the jungles to defend their villages. Brzezinski deduced that it was necessary to hijack these sentiments that Vietnamese communists had tapped into with their global public relations campaign opposing the presence of U.S. troops. The idea was to set up the Afghan trap to give the Soviet Union their own Vietnam War. In an interview with the French newspaper La Nouvelle Observateur, he explained his thinking. 
Despite this risk, you are an advocate of this covert action, but perhaps you yourself desired the Soviet entry into the war and looked for a way to provoke it. It wasn't quite like that. We didn't push the Russians to intervene, but we knowingly increased the probability that they would. When the Soviets justified their intervention by asserting that they intended to fight against secret U.S. involvement in, in Afghanistan, nobody believed them. However, there was an element of truth in this. You don't regret any of this today? Regret what? The secret operation was an excellent idea. It had the effect of drawing the Russians into the Afghan trap, and you want me to regret it? The day the Soviets officially crossed the border, I wrote to President Carter, essentially, We now have the opportunity of giving the USSR its Vietnam War. Indeed, for almost 10 years, Moscow had to carry on a war that was unsuitable for the regime, a conflict that brought about the demoralization and finally the breakup of the Soviet Empire. And neither do you regret having supported Islamic fundamentalism, which has given arms and advice to future terrorists? What is more important in world history, the Taliban or the collapse of the Soviet Empire? Some agitated Muslims or the liberation of Central Europe and the end of the Cold War? CBS News was caught airing staged battle footage to make the Islamic extremists fighting the Soviet Union, led by young Osama bin Laden, look like romantic freedom fighters. The fake footage was exposed by the Columbia School of Journalism Review and the New York Post. In 1989, the Associated Press confirmed the reports. Most of the footage was shot by cameraman Mike Hoover, who allegedly staged scenes of guerrilla sabotage and made a Chinese-built Pakistani jet on a training run appear to be a Soviet plane bombing Afghan villages. The 1987 James Bond film, The Living Daylights, was dedicated to the brave Mujahideen fighters of Afghanistan. By appealing to the leftist ascetics with slick propaganda, the Western imperialists could defeat the communists. Covert manipulation of leftist politics, which began with the Congress for Cultural Freedom program, escalated. Zbigniew Brzezinski famously coined the term Eurocommunist in reference to the fact that in 1978, the French, Italian, and Spanish Communist parties denounced the Soviet Union's foreign policy, echoing the very allegations against the USSR made by the U.S. State Department. This had been the result of decades of covert manipulation. Academics had a great deal of influence within the European Communist parties. They received grant money from CIA-linked foundations and were carefully nudged to emphasize social liberalism and move in an anti-Stalinist direction. The Frankfurt School, covertly supported by the CIA from as early as the 1950s, emphasized the need to focus on intellectuals, not the working class, and combined Freudian psychoanalysis with Marxism, focusing on cultural criticism. The writings of Antonio Gramsci, an Italian communist who wrote coded notebooks from within a fascist prison, were pushed to front while the key ideological texts of Marx and Lenin were ignored. The idea that the Soviet Union was made up of red fascists and totalitarians who had betrayed the ideals of workers' democracy and permanent revolution was covertly financed and pushed into leftist circles. Figures associated with the Congress for Cultural Freedom and Partisan Review became iconic voices of a new left that viewed working people as a mob of inferior rabble who threatened the independence of the intellectuals. Susan Sontag declared in an essay called Fascinating Fascism, written for the New York Times Review of Books, that many aspects of the USSR and the Eastern Bloc were somehow fascist. She wrote, Fascism also stands for an ideal, or rather ideals, that are persistent today under the other banners. Ideal of life as art, the cult of beauty, the fetishism of courage, the disillusion of alienation and the ecstatic feelings of community, the family of man, extravagant effort and the endurance of pain, the massings of groups of people, the turning of people into things, the multiplication and replication of things and grouping of people slash things around an all-powerful hypnotic leader figure or force. 
The fascist dramaturgy centers on the orgastic transactions between mighty forces and their puppets, mass athletic demonstration, a choreographed display of bodies, or a valued activity in all totalitarian countries, and the art of the gymnast, so popular now in Eastern Europe, also evokes recurrent features of fascist aesthetics, the holding in or confining of force, military position. In essence, Sontag argued that because the Marxist-Leninist governments mobilized their populations and unleashed a spirit of selflessness and community, they were inherently fascist. To Sontag, whose career began with the CIA-backed partisan review, leftist politics was simply about unleashing impulses and protecting the individuality of intellectuals. When Brzezinski helped to stage an uprising among dock workers in his homeland of Poland against the Marxist-Leninist government, many in the confused American leftist movement supported the anti-communist protests, aside from a few hardliners such as the Communist Party USA or the Workers' World Party, labeled Stalinists and tankies by detractors. The Western left embraced what was later proven to be a CIA operation intended to destabilize socialism in Poland. At a New York City rally of Trotskyists, hippies, anarchists, and other leftists who backed the Solidarity movement in Poland, Susan Sontag proclaimed, Communism is fascism, successful fascism, if you will. What we have called fascism is, rather, the form of tyranny that can be overthrown, that has largely failed, I repeat, not only is fascism an overt military rule, the probable destiny of all communist societies, especially when their populations are moved to revolt. But communism is in itself a variant, the most successful variant of fascism, fascism with a human face. The entire nature of left-wing politics had been changed and remains completely disordered right up to today. It is this distortion that made the rise of Kamala Harris possible. A crude Freudian manipulation. Across Eastern Europe, in China, and in many other places, the socialist governments were represented on U.S. television as tanks, faceless, cruel, metallic machines. Meanwhile, the U.S.-aligned dissidents were portrayed as free thinkers, intellectuals, and idealists. The Marxist-Leninist regimes were portrayed as militarists crushing peace-loving hippies and artists who wanted freedom. But underneath the new left's rejection of class struggle, economic analysis, and embracing of freedom as ideal was a contempt of fear of common people. Hannah Arendt, one of the definitive new left thinkers on totalitarianism, wrote a piece entitled Eichmann in Jerusalem, a report on the banality of evil. The piece focuses on Adolf Eichmann, the Nazi war criminal abducted by Mossad and executed in Jerusalem for his crimes against Jews during the Holocaust. Aaron's text goes to great lengths to describe how much of a typical human being Eichmann was. The text is widely read to be a warning against conformity and just following orders. However, another implication beneath Aaron's contempt for Eichmann as a joiner who had been part of the YMCA before joining the Nazi party the implication that deep down, ordinary people, the working class, are all potential Nazis. The implication is that every barrier must be erected to restrain and control the ignorant rabble, to protect the enlightened view. The implication is also that those who would rally the masses to fight for their interests against the elite and the wealthy ruling class are inherently dangerous even if their organizing takes place on the basis of a revolutionary progressive platform. In the minds that make up the entity, which is rightly called the synthetic left, the broad masses of people must be controlled and restrained. Social engineering, deceptive propaganda, a surveillance apparatus, and police state are all necessary to make sure that they never begin to assert their wishes. Prior to the Second World War, socialism and communism in the United States were considered to be populist movements. They fought for working people against the ruling elite. They built solidarity between different races and nationalities with slogans like Black and White, Unite and Fight. They built unemployment councils and labor unions to win economic justice, waging a class struggle on behalf of the working class majority against the exploiting capitalist elite. 
Sigmund Freud, beloved by the Frankfurt School, who somehow combined the worldview of an anti-communist with Marxism, was quite outspoken in his contempt for ordinary people and the morals by which they live. Freud's text, Civilization and its Discontents, go as far as to mock the golden rule of Christianity, love your neighbor as yourself. Freud writes, Why should we do it? What good will it do us? But above all, how shall we achieve it? How can it be possible? My love is something valuable to me, which I ought not to throw away without reflection. It opposes duties on me for whose fulfillment I must be ready to make sacrifices. Freud writes that much of the mental illness of the world is rooted in guilt around natural feelings of selfishness and aggression which cannot be overcome. He writes, I remember my own defensive attitude when the idea of an instinct of destruction first emerged in psychoanalytic literature and how long it took before I became receptive to it. For little children do not like it when there is talk of an inborn human inclination to badness, to aggressiveness and destruction, and so to cruelty as well. The commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself, is the strongest defense against human aggressiveness and an excellent example of the unpsychological proceedings of the cultural superego. The commandment is impossible to fulfill. Anyone who follows such a precept in present-day civilization only puts himself at a disadvantage, vis a vis the person who disregards it. In the absence of class solidarity and economic notions of socialism as central planning and construction, many have noted that leftism has largely degenerated to a form of victimology. Various forms of oppression, racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, mistreatment of the disabled, and body shaming are denounced and studied in great depth. In left-wing discourse, Individuals are given permission to feel that they have been victimized for this unfairness and unleash their rage. They get to satisfy their impulse toward aggression by exacting revenge for their perceived oppression. So how did Kamala Harris grow up among anti-racist activists, aware of the legacy of Jim Crow and injustices of the U.S. legal system, and yet become a sadistic perpetrator of mass incarceration, because we cannot expect her to love her neighbor as herself or feel empathy for her victims. The liberation of a woman of color who has clearly suffered great hardship and injustice in her life is enacted by lifting moral restraints and allowing her to act out her rage. According to the logic of Frankfurt School cultural critics, the postmodernists, Sigmund Freud, and other pseudo-leftists who view Marxism as merely a vehicle for deconstruction, Kamala Harris's life is a beautiful thing. A person from historically marginalized groups has become empowered to unleash her rage onto the world. The myths that once held society together and restrained such behavior have been deconstructed. The psychology of the revolutionary intelligentsia, when stripped of any scientific Marxist ideology, the mindset of angry crowds screaming around the guillotine has become incarnated in an age where Twitter anger and wokeness has replaced the notion of human progress. Kamala Harris is the logical conclusion of a long process of distorting leftist politics and reducing it to a crude Freudian manipulation.